signature. I am a math consultant at KDOT. We are going to talk today about number sense and fluency and what does that mean for our students. I hope you enjoy our presentation. Our agenda for today for number sense and fluency revolves around the standards, the math practices, questioning, number sense, of course the three aspects of a number, counting, what fluency looks like for our students, and then what are some games, activities that we can do to promote that fluency along with screeners and resources that you may need. These are the books in which a lot of our stuff come from. Uh, the big one being right here, Developing Number Knowledge. And this is a book that we look at, especially if you're just getting those students to understand what number sense really is. The other books here are uh, Kathy Richardson, and we highly recommend those. Uh, those books provide a lot of activities that get our students fluent. This is where a lot of the information today that you, you're going to get comes from. To talk about our standards, we are looking to add where the students should be. We look at what we need to teach to get them to that standard and what is expected for our students. Um, we, in our standards, we notice that the students aren't only expected to understand the content, but there are key behaviors, and those are outlined in the standards for math practices. Now, for many of you guys, I know you know what standards of math practice is. I'm just going to click on them. You can go to this site right here, and Dave's going to drop it in the chat for you to look at. But you can go to this one. The big one for us is the very first one. Make sense of a problem and persevere in solving them. Many of our students want to give up, and that's why questioning is so important for our students. Go back, and we want to make sure that they understand uh, to persevere through. And so, of course, this is the link for our standards, and we can talk about those in just a little bit. Now, remember, we aim for procedural skills, and we have fluency that students need to be at certain grade levels. The first thing I want us to really look at is inside of all of our standards are the math practices and the math teacher practices. Now, I developed with uh, another colleague of mine um, this document here. And this is, I call it the questioning with the MTPs. This document is for you to use. Uh, it's got the math teaching practice, of course, establishing math goals to focus learning. And then it goes into talking about what the teacher does, what the student does, and then the questions that the teacher can ask themselves when you're developing lessons, and then questions you're going to want to ask the student. We also tied this in to connecting to the high leverage practices, the HLPs, and there's a little overview here for each one of the HLPs. And then again, we connected that one, the math teaching practice here, to all of the standards for math practices for the student. Again, the same thing here, implementing tasks to promote reasoning and problem solving. What the teacher does, what the student does, the questions that the teachers can ask themselves when you're planning a lesson, and then questions that you're gonna ask your students. The reason I put these questioning in there is sometimes we don't really think about the questions we can ask our students to kind of lead them into what they need to understand. We, we want to know what they know and where they need to go. And so that's one of the things that I really wanted to put in here was that part. And then of course, a connection to the HLPs. That's extremely important. So at your leisure today at some point, take time to look over this document. And I'm sure that Doug will be dropping that in. Now, the fluency for math standards are first of all in kindergarten. It is add and subtract within five. Now, for adding and subtracting within five, that seems like it's not very big, but it's huge for our students. For them to add and subtract within five, they have to be able to understand all of the inclusion of a number. And in that inclusion of the number, knowing that five is five and zero, four and one, three and two, two and three, 
one and four and zero and five. So understanding that entire inclusion of a number. The other thing that we need to know there is that this is just the fluency standard that they are going to do within this, of course, on the standards is they're going to be able to count to 20. They're going to understand addition and subtraction up to 10, um, even though it doesn't say they're fluent up to 10. They only need to be fluent up to five. The other thing that they have to do is be able, like I said, to count. There's um, no understanding their um, shapes. They have multiple things that you're going to be working on all year. This is just the fluency standard. And it's really hard for our kids, for you to be able to ha give them counters and for them to be able to see it and then say, oh, well, two plus three is five. So five take away three is two. To be able to go forward and backward in the addition and subtraction is really huge for our students. Of course, within first grade, it is add and subtract within 20, but they're only fluent with add and subtract within 10. Now, I know you're thinking, okay, that's just five more, but if they're truly fluent within 10, there is so much that they truly understand. And we want to really push for them to be fluent within 10. And then of course, in second grade, they're fluent within 20 using mental strategies. So they understand within 20 what numbers put together. They understand that um, using the friendly 10, they know all of those strategies to be able to get within 20. And I don't know how many times I've asked third grade teachers, what's one big thing that you wish all your students could do? And they're like, add and subtract within 20. So if there's one thing that you're working toward, it's that add and subtract within 20 and for them to be truthfully not just fluent, but automaticity. And then of course for third grade, it makes a big jump because now our fluency isn't with add, add and subtract, it is fluently multiply and divide within 100 using strategies such as relationships of multiplication and division and properties of operation. So there is a huge jump between second grade to third grade and fluency changes to multiplication and division. So keep that in mind. And then of course, one thing that we most want to understand for our students is that first grade, it starts relating it back to addition and subtraction. I want you to take just a moment and in the chat, put what is the difference between fluency and automaticity? What is your understanding between fluency and automaticity? And if you can't do the chat, you're more than welcome to unmute and we'll talk about it right now. So what is the difference between fluency and automaticity? Fluency is being able to solve facts automatically. Well, fluency is being able to have a, a strategy to solve facts. Um, so they have that strategy and they understand automaticity is just like we talked about uh, up here earlier. It is about knowing without solving. It's just, I know it. Nine plus nine is 18. I, didn't really have a strategy to that. I just know it. It's, it's automatic that it comes to the top of my head. For many of our students, they don't have automaticity, but they do have fluency. They have a strategy um, and a strategy that works for them. So um, with fluency, we want our kids to have, have a strategy. The more they do certain activities, they become quicker at it. So yes, um, Fluency is not about fast, really, but it is about understanding that strategy and being able to work through it quicker. So, automaticity is it's just right there. It's right at the top, uh, tip of my tongue. I know it. It's just there. Um, fluency, like I said before, that's having that strategy. So, yes. Thank you, guys. Now, components of fluency. Components are, they are efficient. They can work through the strategy very, you know, efficiently. They understand it. They can explain it. They know that. Accuracy is, of course, they get it right when they work through that strategy. And then flexibility is, can I do it another way? So sometimes we need for them to have flexibility to be able to take that strategy and work ahead with it into another component that they're doing in mathematics, or also to be able to use that and go ahead and work through uh, using it maybe a different strategy. They're kind of flexible with it. So.
So that's important for our students. The four key elements of fluency is modeling. Of course, they are able to model what they know. They have multiple opportunities to be able to show their understanding. They get immediate, immediate corrective feedback from you. This is huge for our students, not just in mathematics, but also in reading and writing. That immediate corrective feedback, don't allow them to do 10 problems wrong because if they do, it's so hard to undo that. So three problems and then check. Um, a good way to do that is two problems check with a partner and then three problems check with me so that they know if they're doing it correctly and they've got that feedback from someone. Okay, and then of course, appropriate ratio of known to unknown problems when they're working through things. For our students not to feel like or want to give up and to persevere on through, having some of the problems that they know that they can move through rather quickly and then some problems that they don't know so that they kind of have to struggle, this helps them too. Another thing that it does, it allows them to pull from their long-term memory and we want them to be able to do that. We want that retrieval so that they're pulling from it and they're using that information. So this is all again in that implementing an effective mathematics fact fluency practice. And this comes from Paul uh, Riccamini. So um, he's got some really good stuff for those things. But those are the four key elements that we make sure when we're working with fluency. Now, as you can see on the screen, these are some wonderful things that we use daily. We use these all the time. We want them to have a number chart. We want them to have the ability to use number bonds and 10 frames and five frames. We want them to use a balance so that they can see that equation, the equal sign is truly a balance, not just an equal sign. And oh, there's an answer that pops up at the other side of that number. No, it's a balance so that they can see how that works. And it doesn't matter if you use the balance that has the numbers on it, or if you use a balance like this one right here that has the teddy bears. The one thing I would suggest is that you use two colors only, that you don't give them all the colors of the teddy bears, that you only use two colors, and so they work within two colors. Counters. I love two-sided counters. Uh, they're wonderful to use. A bead rack is perfect, or a bead string. I am a big fan and a component of the bead string. Now, Miss Bondo was a big fan and a component of the number cubes, and they're both wonderful. Sometimes we teach our students strategies that we are more comfortable with, but we have to also go outside of our uh, comfort zone and we have to teach our students using the things that they need to use so that they can become comfortable in real life. Another thing is the sticks, the bundles and sticks. We want them to use those often, and this really helps them with addition and subtraction within 100. And of course, not just using one thing because even though this is good uh, the bundles and six is good for addition and subtraction within 100 so are our place value blocks so keep that in mind they need to be able to transfer that knowledge within the concrete representations that they have and then of course one of the easy but high effective uh, things that you can use are dice like i said i love things that are easy to plan easy to pull out and use but yet are, give me some high quality things to work with. So these are just a few. The other one up here is just plain cashier's tape. Now, a lot of places will give you their leftover rolls when they get down to just so much. They'll have these, ask for them because if they'll gather them up and give them to you, then you've got perfect things for not only making number lines, but for fractions, when you're teaching fractions, those that's huge. <coughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me for a moment. Um, so making sure of those. Now, the three aspects of a number. What are the three aspects of a number? One is verbal. Can they count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The next one is quantitative. Can they see? five items in your hand and go that's five one two three four five and they can actually do the one-to-one -one correspondence and then of course the last one 
which is really abstract, is just the symbolic. The number five, seeing that and understanding that that falls back to the quantitative of five things and then on to the verbal of five. So you want them to do all of that. Now, counting and carnality, the progression in which we want them to have. We want them to be able to have number sequencing of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, of course, the one to one correspondence. I want them, to, they're going to sing song, of course, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But then I want them to be able to go and drop in two if they need to with the one to one correspondence with a cup. And if you can see my screen here, one, two, three, four, five. They can hear it and they say it when it drops. That's one of the big things. And then being able to pour it out and look at it again in their hand and say, oh, that's five. Now that's huge because sometimes they'll pour it out and it'll be spread out and then go, oh, that's eight. And you're like, what did we just count? And then you do it again. They'll say, okay, let's count again. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. I pour it out. They see it spread out here in my hand and they say oh that's five and then you ask them how did they know well maybe they saw three and two so that's some of the ways that I want them to be able to do that subitizing is basically being able just to see it and know it they understand thought patterns so let's put yourself in their shoes for just a few minutes this is a new kid learning so I want you to put yourself in their shoes Start at the letter O and say the alphabet forward. Just take a minute in your head. O. That wasn't too hard, was it? You were able to do that pretty easily. Now, say the letter that comes right after J. So, that one again. It's pretty easy because it's the letter right after. Now I'll say the letter that comes right before M. Did you have to get a run and go? That's what we call it, a run and go, where you have to back up, say a couple letters beforehand, and then do it like maybe J, K, L, M. And so they know that. And then, of course, now take the time to spell your first and last name backward. We write our first and last name forward all the time. Take just a few minutes and try to spell your first and last name backward without looking at it. Was that hard for anyone? For me, it's a little bit easier because my last name is so short, but for some, I can see how that could be very difficult. And think about how it is for our students when we ask them to do things like that. One of the things that we don't do is practice things backward very often. So as a teacher, we have to get comfortable with, if we're gonna do it forward, we also need to do it backward because guess what? If we're doing addition, we should be doing subtraction. If we're doing multiplication, we should be doing division because they are related. And it's the same thing with if we're going to count forward, we need to be counting backward. Um, if we're going to skip count forward, we need to skip count backward because we're doing the addition part, but we're also doing the subtraction part. So keeping that in mind. So this is extremely important for our students. All right, then Say the name of the fifth letter in the alphabet from S. Were you able to do that without a problem? Or did you have to go S, T, U, B, W, X? Oh, it's X. I mean, did you have to do that? Because for some of us, we do. Counterrounds. Now, this is important for our students. This is important for us to do every day. Counter rounds should include a 
course, addressing the verbal aspect. We can do count arounds when we're lighting up, when we're coming back from lunch, when we're going to lunch, when we're going to uh, outside for recess. Count arounds can be done any time that we're lighting up. It can focus on problem areas. I was in a classroom where the teacher did count arounds to change activities. And so that's a really good way to get count arounds in. And it can focus on pro problem areas. Counting by three, skip counting is one of the things we can do. It can focus on um, counting backward for our students. So forward number sequencing always first. And so if we do forward number sequencing, after that, we're going to, of course, do back number sequencing. And we want to make sure that they can do that. And then, of course, crossing the decades. It's so huge for our students to be able to cross the decades. Many of our kids will get to 10 and then they can't remember what 11 is. Or they get to 20 and they can't do 21. Um, or they'll get, uh, the best one is they get to 100 and then they're like, they don't know what comes next. Well, it's 101. So, and then of course, making sure they're not saying and. Um, counting by twos, fives, tens, forwards, and backwards, keep that in mind. We always have to do both of those together. So if they're going to do it forward, they have to go backwards. So maybe today I start at um, 28, and I said we're going to go backward by twos. So 28, 26, and if we were sitting in a classroom right now or in a, uh, an, uh, a conference room, we would be actually doing this activity. I would have you count forward by twos, and then we would count backward by twos or we would do it by fives, and we don't always start at the same place. If I'm in second grade, sometimes I would count forward by twos, but we'd start at seven. So then it's we're counting the odds, those kind of things, and we talk about that. Um, count by tens off the decades, so forwards and backwards. So maybe we're going to count by tens, and we're starting at 12. So 12, then the next person would be 22, and then and they would continue that way. Um, number sequencing with a num numeral track. This is one, and I would suggest you make one of these. They're not hard to make. Um, you can just take a file folder. Let me grab mine real quick. As you can see here in my camera, I have one that's created. This is just a file folder. I've taken a, about three inches over, cut slits through, and inside is just a strip of, a sentence strip, and I've got numbers in it. And it's upside down in this case. And so if I'm working off of that decade and the student's really having trouble, I say, okay, let's look at the number that's here. That's 40. Well, what number comes right after 40? And the student would turn it over and say, oh, well, that is 41. So what number comes before 40? And so they would have to look at that and they would be like, okay, I think it's 39 and they can self-check. So I really like this for that ability to be able to self-check. And if you've used these before, I highly recommend you can have multiple ones like the one here on the screen. You can actually see that they are working with multiple numbers at a time. And so the student can work within that. Now, I've also used this for place value, and so the student would put a number down here, and let's say it's 142, and I'd say, well, if I said 142, what's in the tens place? And that would have been a four, and then what was in the ones place? Two, right? And so they would flip over that and say, am I correct? Yes. And so they can do this also with place value. This is great for students who have a uh, for later on that's using the decimal so keep that in mind too you want to use this right here and for students and you'll have the tenths and the hundredths on here along with the one um, so that's how we use uh, number sequencing with a number track and I really love this activity and they're easy to make like I said it's just a file folder is what I did and you can actually get two out of a file folder because you're just cutting them off and then uh, putting them back together with just a piece of duct tape. The one thing I do recommend that you do that I didn't do with this one is put a piece of the duct tape on the inside because sometimes this sticky tape sticks to your number strips. And they're very durable. The kids can use them quite often. 
they're cheap. So one of the things that this does is it addresses both the symbolic and the verbal component of the number, and it can be adapted for specific word sequencing areas of difficulty, along with it's in our K and P guide, and there's different activities that you can do within it. Now, if you have not seen the KNP guide, I'm going to take you to it really quickly here. This is our KNP guide, and this has different activities in which you can do for five frame flashcards, 10 frame flashcards, fractional rulers, of course, and here's the numeral track in which I was talking about. There's also the spinners that I like, and of course, there's different tools down through here than which you can go to. So this is a great place to be. I'm going to send you this PowerPoint so you'll be able to get to the KMP guide. Count objects in a collection. We want to be able to count objects in the collection, and we want to make sure that the students, when they look at it, they're actually having a good counting off strategy. And so one of the things that for our most of our students that they have trouble with is organizing. And I'm going to give you just a couple of, of hints just later on for how to organize their stuff and to make sure that they understand organizing their work. So, and then of course, tracking, using a system to keep track of what has already been counted. Many times we'll see kids, and I love this one, it's the head nod that you'll see. And let's say they've got five, and I'm going to put it up on the camera here. We're going to go out for just a second. We'll put up the ladybug camera here. So you'll see students do this right here. Hopefully you can see my screen. Doug, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, ma'am, I can see it. Okay, so you'll see them do this and just watch my head, they'll go. It's kind of like a chicken picking, right? Is what they'll do. And so they'll say six, but they really, or they may even say five because they didn't count all of them. They were just trying to. Having students to use something like this right here, which is a wiki stick, or even just a line on their desk to where they arrange them is very valuable. So this is a wiki stick, and what I like about it is it sticks down, and it actually stays in place really good. And I have students to start to organize. This is a big problem all of our students have, is organization. And so I tell them they have to touch the line. Sometimes if they've got tape, I tell them they have to bump over the line. And when they bump over, that's when they're allowed to count. But in this case, they would go one, two, three, four, five, six. They had to touch the line. They've got them lined up. That's what I want for our students, is for them to be able to organize. And that's really important for our students. So, uh, like I said, a wiki stick, a piece of tape, anything that you can help, um, a sheet of paper where they organize to the top of it each time, or if you have, of course, your 10 frames. This allows them to organize too. At any point, they can organize to that. And so they put them on there. And of course, we want them to go across, but sometimes we have vertical learners and they go down. So don't be afraid if they're doing this right here, they're just, they just end up being a vertical learner. And that's okay. And they'll say that they see it. And they may say, I see two, two, and two instead of three and two. And that's fine too. Just, they, they have to develop their strategy. And when they develop that strategy, that's what's gonna stick with them the most. Count to tell how many. This is so important for our students. Counting to tell how many. And this is, like I said, they get very, very confused. You'll see the little head bob. You'll see the little thing of where if it's really messed up, they'll, they'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and they just keep on going. Well, they don't know to stop. They don't know which ones they've counted. So, again, teaching them to organize is important. So, um, what, is the, what does this actually mean, count to tell how many? They don't sometimes understand that if they can't organize their thoughts. And then, how is it different from being able to count to 100? Well, if I'm counting to tell how many, I'm counting a specific amount. If I'm counting just to 100 or counting just to 10, it becomes sing-song, right? 
So that's another thing is do they do it like it's a song or do they do it as if they're counting to really understand what's there? If they're counting their fingers, sometimes you'll see them go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and no, let's count. One, they have to touch it. Two, three, four, five. So they touch, and when they touch or when they hear it, this could be another one. One, two, they can't say it until they hear it. Three, four. At this point, also, you can use an xylophone to help them to do that. They can count when they hear it. You can use just a solo cup, and they count when they hear it. One, two, three, four. So also with listening, making sure that they can count an object. So that's very different from just that sing song of counting to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They actually have to do the objects. And that's really hard for our students. And sometimes we have to back up and do this multiple times with them. Because being able to count and see that number is also the way in which they start to understand how many that truly is. Okay, so once I understand once a student understands that the last number name says the number of the objects counted, they have established what? What have they established? Cardinality. Okay, so they have established cardinality. They understand how many a certain number is as they have counted, and the last number is that number. So, of course, cardinality is conservation of a number. A number means an amount, and that amount doesn't change regardless of the arrangement. Now, I love it because our kids will see this totally different. So, I'm, again, I'm going back to my little document camera down here, guys. Um, I'm sorry to be flipping back and forth, but it's the nature of the beast here. So, let's say that we've got four. And we have them arranged like this. Well, let's do five because five is harder for our students sometimes. So we've got five and they're arranged like this. And the students count them and they go one, two, three, four, five. And all you do is take those five and you move them around. And then you just spread them out like this and say, how many is there? And they'll say seven. Again, then you have to say, no, count them. And they may go one, two, three, four, five. And they can stop because they went from top to bottom. And they say, nope, it's five. Understanding that if I drop five in a cup and I lay them out, that's still five. It hasn't changed the amount. That's understanding cardinality. And we want them to be able to do that. So for our students, again, this is five, this is five, and this is five. And regardless of the amount, this is still five. So that's what we want for our students. There are different types of subitizing. There is perceptual subitizing, which means they can quickly see an amount and without having to count the objects, they just say that's the number, three. They understand three on a dice. They understand three in your hands. They understand this is three. They understand three tally marks. They understand perceptual, under, they have perceptual subitizing. So they get that. Conceptual subitizing is recognizing a collection of objects compo composed of two things that are put together. So a good example here is five and one, that's six. And that's conceptual subitizing. Dice, uh, you can get these kind of cards. If you're looking at my screen here. And they'll be in two different colors. And so let's say we're working with this one here. And they may have it to where these six on top are one color and these three on the bottom are another color. Or the students can see it this way, maybe, to where it is three and six, and then they'll automatically say nine. This is a really good way to get them to start looking at conceptual subitizing. What's the numbers you see there? So that's what conceptual subitizing is. I love the two colors when they start, but I want to take that away after a while because I want to give them the opportunity to how do you see it. Because one student may see this as three, three, and three. And others may see this as one, two, three, and three. And they may have to do it that way. Um, another student may see the full six and three. Or they may see eight and one. So different ways that they may see this. Just keep that in mind.
and we want to have that conversation. These are great for number talks. So if you have the opportunity to do number talks and it probably should be built into your schedule for just a little bit every day, this would be a really good one because you're getting that addition in there too. Starting supervising, we use things that are known to the students, things that are more common. So we try to use the more common dice patterns and that's important for our students too, is using those more common. We're going to show it, right? We're going to talk about it. What do you see here? Well, five. Well, how do you know it's five? Well, it's two, one, two, or it's three and two. How are the ways that we, we see that? And then, of course, describing it each time. That's how we start with supervising. Show it. Let me get a, a simpler one here. Maybe. Right here. I'm going to show it. So if I show this one, you automatically see three, right? So I see three, and then I say, okay, let's talk about it. How do you know that's three? I can count them. One, and then I'll need to put their finger on them. This is harder to do backward. Two and three. So we can count them. We'll talk about it, and then we'll describe it. Well, where else have you seen this? Well, on dice, we've seen that. Um... And then, of course, we do the simple one. Uh, we flash, count to three. What'd you see? Three. Again, flash. What'd you see? And then they should be able to say six. Okay. And then how did you see it? I saw three and three. I saw two, two, and two. You'll see it. You'll hear it multiple ways of how did you see it. So being able to make sure you have those conversations with it. Because many kids, you'll start to see which way they're actually noticing the patterns. Uh, begin with the reg regular domino patterns of up to six. And then you're going to change. You're going to move into irregular patterns up to six. Like I said, keeping those numbers to something they know. So if they only know numbers up to five, keep it up to five. Um, if they only know it up to three, keep it to in three, adding one more each time. Um, create component groupings using spacing and or color. Like I said, if I use color after a while, I take that color away because we want to just talk about what's, what's there. We're going to talk about grow and shrink next. So with grow and shrink, it's a board that looks like this and it's inside of the, the books. For Kathy Richardson, and I'm trying to look and see if I can have my books here. Just let you look at, but it's inside book two. Well, here it is, book one and book two. You'll find these games in there. They are um, on page. Well, I've got them right here. Page 33 and 35, 133 and 130 through 137. So we're going to talk about grow and shrink because this is like one of my favorites. So I want to show you a little board about doing this so this is our grow and shrink board and as you can see it's set up very similar to a tin frame and so all that you need is a die and so you get a die and of course you know our wonderful cubes that we use so that's really all you need so here's my die and now we are going to uh, just roll the die and we're going to grow or shrink according to that so we're going to work within six but now you may change and have just a foam die that you've got numbers on and you want them to work within that so in this case we're working within six and so i roll the dice the first time and i get a four and so i lay out four two and of course we want them to go across the top but they may not and that's fine too that they may not go just across the top. And so we say, okay, you roll four, you've got four. Now, I want to roll again. Six. Now, I have to keep what's there. But how do I get to six? And this is where it's very important because we want our students to communicate. I've got four. And to get to six, I'll need to add five. Six, I added two. So at this point, they may not be able to do that. They may have to go one, two, three, four, five six and count up they're not ready for starting at four and going on um so they're going to need multiple exposures to doing that 
and understanding that this is four, the next number is going to be five, the next number is going to be six. And then, of course, they're going to roll again and get six. And I'm going to say, okay, how many do you have on the board? At this point, if the student don't remember, I've got six, or they can't see this, and the five and the one is six, and they have to count them up. And you can say, well, I'm not adding any more, or I'm not taking any. You'll want, like I said, multiple exposures to be able to do that. This is why this is so important. So now they roll and they get one. And you can say, okay, so now what do I kind of do to get to one? And the student can say, well, I'm going to take away or I'm going to remove. Um, and they'll need to tell you how many they're going to remove to get to one. So maybe one, two, three, four, five. I'm at one. And so you want them to have that communication over and over again of this is how many I'm going to add. This is how many I'm going to remove or take away. And so that they have that conversation over and over again. This is a great one for students to play in pairs. It's a great one for students to play one-on-one -on -one with you. Those kind of things or in a small group. All right. So that's grow and shrink. Our next one that we were wanting to talk about. Let me go back to that one. Was creation station. So with creation station. In your books. You will find these right here. These are awesome for our students. So what it is, is we're going to take the dog. So this is a dog. They have to build a dog standing up. And you're going to say, how many cubes are you going to need to build a dog? One, two, three, four, five, six. So they need six cubes. So you can lay out six cubes. Now build the dog. So they need two for the dog to stand up on its legs. Three for the body. And they have to look at it. And say okay which way does the body need to go and so there's that and then one for the head and the head's going to sit right here at the beginning of the body and so does it look like that now like i said it needs to be standing up at this point if it took six to build one dog how many would it take to build two dogs and so the student would again build another dog or they would say six and six more that's 12. and so that's what you hope they get to but of course, if not, like I said, six and six more, and they would build six more, and now it takes 12, and they would know that. Another good one, and there's different ones in here. There's the table. Um, there's the robot and the bench, as you can see. The caterpillar, which is an easy one for them, and I really like that one. The tree. The kids love building these. And we talk about how many is in each one. What would, you know, if I have 12 uh, blocks, how many dogs can I build? If I had 18 blocks, how many dogs can I build? You can talk about that. Uh, then, of course, the horse, the pig, the doorway, slide, and fireplace. These make great stations for the students to build. And you can have little cards that go with them. Say, if I have plate number of blocks how many of how many slides can i build how many would i have any left over those kind of things so that they can do those and then the last one is floor build a floor and so again you're using the dice you're going to roll the dice one well they're, they're building the one and if they roll a dice and they build four they put them together and they make four. You can talk about whether it's two and two, one and four. How did they create that floor? And so they, they're just building that. And so they can arrange them however they need and talk about how did they build their floor. And so that's floor. So like I said, in your book, if you go back to your book, in your book on pages, 33 in book one and 35 and then book two 133 and 100 through 137 is the next two games so these are really really good for our students to play multiple times and to get that understanding especially of counting and cardinality but also of what numbers are inclusive into that number That's just three of the games that we really, really like. Tell me fast. 
Tell me fast again is just using your subitizing cards and putting them out in front of you like this right here and say, tell me what you see. I saw three and three. Okay. I saw two, two, and two. What did you see? And then the number, of course. So that's just tell me fast. You're just one, two, three. What'd you see? And then that's it. That's what Tell Me Fast is, and that's in book one, uh, page 42. So if you have these books, um, please use them. They are in a lot of the classrooms because we've had uh, multiple people come to some of our trainings. And so ask in your building. If not, contact me and let me know that you don't have those books. We'll see what we can do to get you some books. Um, let's engage in effective practice. So, snap it. Let's talk about snap it. What does snap it look like? Well, if I'm working within six, and that's what we're going to do today, and I'm going to go ahead and click out of this again. We'll put this over to the side so we can see these. If I'm working within six and I'm playing snap it, only thing that they're going to do is you just snap it, just like it says. You snap it. So, they snap it and say, now, what do you have? Well, I have three and three. And you may have something different, and you may say, oh, I have four and two. So four and two is six, three and three is six, and some student may say, well, I have five and one. And so we just write this down. We just put it out there. This is what we have to make six, all the different ways to make six. So they snap it, and then they work. Another student may say, I have two and four. Then this is where we can start talking about community property and those kind of things within it. So this is snap it. Now wall, um, if we're working with wall, and we're, let's say we're working within six because we're going to use the same numbers here. For wall, I'm going to line them up away from me so you can see each one of them. And I'm going to leave enough room for my hand to go into it. And so at this point, you're going to know if a kid, if the student can subitize a certain number very quickly because you're going to say I want you to wall off two and so if they go right here you know they know what two is very quickly and you can say what's on the other side of the wall well of course they can check they can peek peek over and they can see oh there's four or they may automatically know that's four and if they do then you can start to move to larger numbers again if a student goes, you say, okay, I want you to wall off five, and they go right here, they automatically know that five and one is six. So, and then you can say, well, how many is on the other side? One. And they do it very quickly, then you don't have any problems with that number. Now, of course, if they have to go, and then they put their hand up, they're still having to understand what makes up six. So, you're going to work within this number for quite a while. All right, cave. Okay, this can be bats in a cave, it can be birds in the cave, it can be bears in the cave. But we put uh, six of these in, we turn it over, it's cave, and we say, okay, now pull out two. Cover it back up, I pulled out two. How many did we have total? Six. We pulled out two, how many is in here? Four. And then they count, they check. Now if they say three, you're going to say, well, you might want to check that. One, two, three, four, and they can check. So, and I keep these separated enough to where they can check what did I pull out, what's underneath of here. So, the number that I uh, took from the cave was two. The number that's still in the cave is four. I've got six, and we do it again. We're making that. Okay, now, take out of the cave three bats. So, if I take three bats out of the cave, what was the total number in the cave? Six. I took three bats out. How many bats are left in the cave? And the student says three. Then you know they're able to understand within six. Now, grab bag sounds just like that. In the book, it asks that you use a brown paper bag. Brown paper bags can be very noisy, and brown paper bags tear easy. That's the reason why we like solo cups. Solo cups are, one, cheap. Number two, um, they are very durable. 
for our kids, you know, so that's the other reason why. So, of course, again, we have six in here. Grab bag is just that. We grabbed some out. I grabbed out some. How many do I have? Three. So, how many is in, this, uh, in your solo cup? Three. Okay. Easy way to check. And then, of course, they're going to record this, too. We want to make sure they're recording it. That's a big thing about doing these is I also get the symbolic by recording their answers. So, and these are some of the games that are inside those books that we really, really like and we want you to use because they develop that fluency. It's doing it over and over again, developing the strategies in your mind, getting to the point of automaticity. But they develop strategies. Now, split the pot is exactly what it sounds. Um, so, a student has a container. This is for split the pot. So this is a little container that we got at the dollar store. And the reason why we chose to do a container is a, you can do a plate, but I suggest you have something that's kind of really thick there, like a piece of folded duct tape on the plate to where these fall evenly on each side to where they're not saying, well, that's partially on that side or partially on this side. I've, we've done this before with just a sheet of paper that has a line drawn through it. And like I said, you still get those kids who are going to say this is on that side or this side. So again, for split the pot, it's just this. It's, it's a wonderful little container. They're going to choose one number. And again, I'm using six. And they're going to drop it. And you're going to say, okay, my number is six. How did I get that? Three and three. Try again. My number is six, two, and four. And so they're going to write two and four is six. My number is six. What did I get? Oh, I got two and four again. Do it again. I got three and three. And then they're just going to keep on doing this. Two and four. Or it can be four and two. Two and four. They're going to do this multiple times. I'm probably going to get a one and five. But as you can see, they're going to do this multiple times. So they're going to say six. So two and four, three and three, one and five, five and one. And they're going to do this multiple times where they see the whole inclusion of a number. And I have them to record it. So this is a wonderful game for them to play also that allows them to get multiple exposures to a specific number. And I use a number in which they're having some difficulty with. So if nine's the number they're having difficulty with, they'll use nine. You can also use counters. And so one, two, three, four, five, six. They put them in their cup. As you can see here, they put them in their cup. I've got them in my cup. They pour them out, and then they lay them out. So what do they have? Well, I have three and three. And so they put them in their cup. Them up, pour them out. This time I have four and two. And so they can do this with counters. So that's another way that they can play split the pot. It's a great game for them to be able to do. Now, we have been talking this entire time about ways to develop this fluency standards. And these are just a few of the wonderful games that are in the Kathy Richardson books that you can use to help the bit to do that. Big things are that they need to see and be exposed to those over and over and over again with multiple ways. You saw me use, of course, the um, cubes. You saw me use uh, counters that are two-sided. One of the things you didn't see me use and I have is a bead string. Now, I love a bead string, and if I'm starting out with numbers within 10, I have a bead string that just has 10 on it, okay? So that's what I will do first. I will just have 10 on my bead string. Sometimes I will have this bead string done with 5 and 5. Now, if I'm going up to 20, I will start to do 5, 5, 5 in, different, uh, in the two colors so they can see it, and then I will move to 10 and 10. 
And the reason being is so that they can start to do this. And we will play with just numbers up to 20. We will just have this on the string. I will say uh, pull down three. And then let's say they're working within 10. How many do you have left? And they should be able to say seven. Um, we can play a game of war with 20 on here. And I'll say, okay, I'm pulling off so many. If I've got, if I'm playing within a hundred, and I'll say I've got 10 and 19. I've got 19 because I can't see the others because the other student has 19. How many do you have? And then they will be able to say, okay, uh, one would make 20. And so then how many do you have on the other side of that? And so they will be able to count and be able to see, oh, I have 70. Um, I have 81. I have 81 because you have 19. I have 81. And so we'll want them to be able to see and be able to count and be able to answer within, of course, 100. But and that's one of the games that they can play. If we're only working within 20, I just want them to have 20 on the string and they're playing that. They can play with partners and that's a really good game. And they're going to record, of course, each one that they do. But again, our fluency standards, if they're in kindergarten, is within five. If it's first grade, within 10. If it's second grade, it's within 20, but they're adding them, subtracting within 100. And then, of course, if it's third grade, we start with multiplication within 100, but we want them to be able to add and subtract within 1,000. Now, these are the games that, like we've said, we have played already to improve our fluency facts. We did uh, split the pot. We did the Grow and Shrink board. We've done um, Tell Me Fast activities. So those are just a few that you can do. Now, I want you right now to take a few minutes and write down a word problem that you use. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about these. Let's talk about how do we look at word problems. We look at word problems as result unknown, change unknown, start unknown, right? This is what we call an add to. We have take from where we have the results unknown, the change is un unknown, and the start is unknown. That's the case. Then we have put together and take from. Total unknown, both add-ins unknown, add-in add unknown, so if we look at this right here, oh, if I can get it going in the right direction, where does most of your problems lie? Let's just kind of look at that. Where does most of your problems lie? And so let's look at, Denise, I'm not picking on you. I'm just going to start with yours, okay, because you were first on my list. So Sarah has three apples. Now, is that the start is known, right? So we know the start is known. So we know it's not this one. Uh, Johnny gives her two more apples. That's the change. The change is known. And how many apples does she have now? Sounds very similar to this. Oh, let's go back. Sorry about that. Um, sounds very similar to this one right here. Two bunnies sat on the grass. Three more bunnies hopped there. How many bunnies are on the grass now so that's a result unknown right that's where this one falls and that is an add to now in the same case of okay denise has very similar right so again she's in this top area here now so she's got three add to two more and this is how many she's got so she's right here now let's talk about victoria's i have 20 pins if i give five pins to my friend how many pe uh, pencils do i have left so in this case she's got 20 she gives five away of course we've we've changed what we're talking about here but it's pencils um how many does she have left we're back to result unknown and then I'm going to go to uh, Desiree's down here. If Adam has three pencils and I and he gives one to Tommy, 
How many pencils does he have left? Again, it's result unknown. It's right here, right? It's total unknown, right? Right through here. And then, of course, we have uh, Deanne's, who is, Dana has seven grapes. She gets three more. How many grapes does she have now? They're right here. The problem is, what we're seeing is, everybody's doing this section here. But, even in kindergarten, the questions that they get asked on the test are where? They're down here. So, do we have anybody who did one down here in this section right here? The compare. That's where they're at. Look at this one. Lucy has two apples. Julie has five apples. How many more apples does Lucy have than Julie? They're doing a compare. Most of the things on the test that they're going to be taking at the end of the year involve questions in this area of compare. We want them to be answering questions out of this area. So we need to be writing our questions more often from this area, especially right here, this add-in unknown, both add-ins unknown, this smaller unknown, bigger unknown, difference unknown in a compare. That's what we want to do. We want to give them questions that fall in this area right through here. And Stephanie, is that true of the alternate assessment as well? Yes, unfortunately. Great, thank you. <laughs> so keep in mind that when we're asking those questions, this is where you want to be looking at. And think about how I can teach my students to use this. A number line is a really good way for your alls that you were just giving me. If I was doing a number line, I could lay those out there, right? without a problem. I'm going to look at this right here. I'm going to, I'm going to go back out in just a minute. I know I'm probably making y'all dizzy from going in and out so much. But if I'm looking at this, and this is my thing, uh, let me see here. Let me look at her chat real quick. I'm going to do just somebody's off the chat. Um, Lori did a, a really good one there for a compare, so that would be a good one. Um, but let's say Haley has six candies. So I can put down that she has six candies, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. And I can say that she gives away three. Now we can go backward if she's going to give away three of them. So she gave away this one. I can, she gave away three of them. How many does she have left? And so they can see that she has three left, right? Or I can just take them away. She gave away three of them. Now how many does she have left? We can see that. If they were drawing on this to show that, she has six. And say that she's here. She has six. She gives away three. Where is she now? I can see that very easily for my students. And they can use a number line or they can use a bar model, whichever one that you want, but you want to give them the ability to understand and use a, a number line. Another thing that they can do is use a hundred chart or just a 10, 10 frame chart. Doesn't matter. But as long as they've got that, and then they can say, okay, if I have six, that's where I'm going to start at, and I give three away, teach them to use these strategies so that they have them. Okay, if I'm doing a compare, so Bobby has seven pairs. Okay, we know he has seven pairs. So I'm going to go ahead and put them on the number line so that he can see them. And in this case, Tom has six more pairs than Bobby. So I know that Tom has how many? He has the same amount as Bobby. So, of course, I'm going to put these out here. And 
Let's go to Brain today. My desk looks like math threw up all over it, which is what it looks like most of the time. My number line is not as good because it doesn't go past here. But he has the same amount as Bobby, and then he's got six more. One, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, we would put them all here on the number line because my number line would be bigger. How many pairs does Tom, how many, how many more pairs, uh, it should be how many more pairs, uh, how many pairs does Tommy have, and they should be able to see 13. So that's what we want from them to be able to do, that compare question. So keep that in mind. And then, of course, they can do that again on the number line, and I would give them two colors to do that with. I would have Bobby in the seven, and they would be in all black. And then maybe if there's another co color that we're going to use that shows Tom six more. And they would make dots on the num on a uh, hundred chart. Just one of the ways that we can make sure they're seeing those. So making sure that they can see all of that. Um, here's one. Robin has nine toy cars. How many more toy cars does she need? To get for her birthday to have 12 toy cars all together. Now, this one has what? Has the result. It has the start. It has the change that's unknown. So, if I was doing this, again, I would have the student doing two colors. And I don't have two colors with me right now. But, I would look at this and I would say, okay, we know she has nine. That's my start. She wants to get to 12. That's my results. What is my change that's going to happen? And the student would be able to say, one, two, three. And so they would be able to see that. And you want to use that vocabulary too. Do you have your start? Do you have your change? Do you have your uh, results? So those are the things that we want to talk to them about also. All right, questions to ask, ask yourself. Questions actually you want to ask your student. Does the mathematics you just do work? And why is this mathematics true? That's another one. Because sometimes they can't answer those questions. But ask them, why is that true? How do you know? Show me that. And how do we answer the whys and the hows of mathematics? Making sure our students can answer those two things, the whys and the hows. Many times when you ask them, how did they get that? They think that they're wrong. It's not true. Sometimes I just want to know how you got to that. The more you ask them that question, many times the more they will start to say, okay, I'm probably right. I just need to explain it to her. It's not that I'm wrong. I just need to make sure I can explain it. This is important for our students, especially later when they get to open response questions and those kind of things that they need to be able to do. But also, if they can explain it, then they understand it. Okay. I am, and if anybody's ever worked with me, a big component of the CSA model. One, the Hattie's effect size for this is huge. We know that the CSA model is one of the biggest things that we can do for our students that's going to get the most bang for our bucks. So if we're going to do anything, we're going to start out with the concrete. And the concrete is the manipulatives that we're going to use. Now, you're going to want to have multiple manipulatives that you're going to be using, whether it's the bead string whether it's the cubes and the counters and a number line. I mean, just having multiple ones because we want the students to be able to transfer that knowledge. I know I have had students myself that could not transfer from the teddy bear counters over to regular counters. They, it was like I was teaching a whole new subject just because I changed what they were using that day. But they need experience with different things. And we want them to be able to transfer that knowledge. And then, of course, anytime I'm doing the concrete, I'm going to have them to picture that image. 
they're going to start creating a mental image or they're going to draw that image and i want them to be able to do that i want them to have multiple exposures to where they're drawing that image and i do this even with my kids who are in middle school when we're working with negative and positive numbers they're doing that so i want them to be able to do that and then of course they're going to do the abstract which is the symbolic they're going to have those things we do not have to do this all together. I may start out with just the concrete and then I'll start adding in the semi-concrete and then the abstract. But I want to make sure that they can at some point tie them all together. So this is our CSA mat. I am going to say this. Typical children, which probably none of us in here have, three times in the concrete, three times in the semi-concrete, and at least two times to three times in the abstract. Now, I just said a typical student. So your student who's a tier three or our students who are a special ed will need many more exposures to it. So they may have to do it 15 times, even 20 times using the blocks and the counters and the number line. They may need that many times again with the semi-concrete and the number line is in the semi-concrete. It's a way for them to draw it. And they may need that many more times again in the abstract. So multiple exposures is what they're going to need. One of the things that I suggest if we're going to do this and we're going to do it often is the CSA mat. And if you do not have a copy of this, if you will send me an email at any point in time, I will gladly send you this copy. Um, and then you can use it at all times and we would put the information and the student would have that on there. They're able to do the concrete, then they're able to draw it out and they're able to put the abstract in there at that point in time. Sometimes the teacher will write the abstract for them to do the rest of the parts. So there may be parts that you can fill in for them. Now, if you have not used Cover Copy Compare, this is interventioncentral.org and Doug can drop that in our um, chat. But Cover Coffee Compare looks just like this right here. This one kind of gets away from all of those parts, but it's good for our students because the verbal aspect that comes along with this one. Now, there's a three, two, one system. And if you've heard me talk about this, you know that it's very important that they follow through. Now, with the Cover Coffee Compare, they have a folding spot that is right down the center of the problem so they fold their paper over onto it but one of the things that they will do is three times they will say the problem so if they're working let's say they're working on their threes and multiplication or even if they're working on addition they're going to say that problem three times so it would be three times 12 is 36 three times 12 is 36 three times 12 is 36 and so then they fold their paper and they write the whole problem down, not just the answer. They write three times 12 is 36. Now, they can't look at it. If they mess that up, they're going to come back to it. This is where I'm um, three, two, one. They're going to come back to it. They're going to check. Three times 12 is 36. Well, if I wrote down three times 12 is 24, then they're going to come back and they're going to say, nope. And they're just going to draw a line through that one. And they're going to do it all over again. 3 times 12 is 36, 3 times 12 is 36, 3 times 12 is 36. They're going to do that repeating, and then they're going to cover it up again, rewrite it, and check again. Now, hopefully this time it's correct. If not, they're going to move on down. You're going to notice on this paper, though, that I've got up here, and this, this is uh, Janina's. We are going to be doing 3 times 12 multiple times down through there. She's got three times 12. One, two, three, four, five, six times down through there. That's one that she's really working on. So we want to make sure, and if you notice, it's got so many unknowns with so many knowns and so many that she's very fluent in. The reason be, I don't want to frustrate her. There is a fine line between frustration and learning sometimes and so I want them to have things they are familiar with that makes it easier for them so that we do not frustrate them and they do persevere 
they're more willing to work on it when they understand and know some of them. So keep that in mind when you're working with those kids. So Intervention Central has these worksheets. You go in, you just fill them out, and they go through them. This is a really good way to help our students with fluency also. Now, this is completely abstract and verbal only. So you're going to need multiple exposures with the other stuff before I get into this part. But I wanted you to have access to this. The salute game. How many of you have ever played the salute game? I know Doug has, but has anybody else played the salute game? Okay, we're gonna play this game and Melissa, I'm gonna show you a card. And Doug, you're going to be my person who gives me the answer, okay? I'm ready. So Melissa, All right, you're, gonna gotcha. see, you're gonna see my card. Well, we're gonna try to do this. We're gonna see my card. You're gonna see my card and I'm gonna see your card. And so you're gonna to have to guess what your number is, okay? So, okay. Doug, I'm gonna quickly show you my both cards, right? Quickly showing you both cards. Doug, what was the answer to those? The answer was nine. So if I'm gonna salute and Melissa saluted, her card is not showing. I can't see my card, right? So she has to guess what her card is. Melissa, if the answer was nine, what's your answer that you've got on your head at this point in time? My answer is two. Your answer is two. So it was mine seven. I think oh, it's I may six. have got it wrong. It may have been eight. Oh, okay. Nope. All right. Nope. Melissa, what was your answer again? Two. He said it was nine. Look what I've got on my head. So tell you what you got on your head? No. No. Tell me what's on yours. If the answer is nine, let's think about that. The answer is nine. How many do I have on my head? So what would be on your head? You would have three, right? Right. So six plus three is nine. So what we would do is Doug would say salute and we would hold up two cards. Now aces are always one, right? So if I hold up so I've got up on my head one, and then Doug says the answer is four. Four, and I would have to say, so I would see your card, which is three, right, on your head. And I would say, oh, well, mine is one. So that's how we play salute. Um, salute is real easy. It's quick check. You can do this with these are negatives or subtraction, and they have to do it. There's multiple ways to do that that you will work through this. But Salute is a really quick game that three kids can play and it has the answer for them. If they have trouble, of course, the person who's just answering says, oh, it's four, because they can count them, right? There's one okay. and then one, two, three, four, right? They can count those right. and they know it's four. But the problem is I can only see yours. So if I know it's four and you've only got, you've got three, then I must have one, right? Right. So I'm doing that harder part. I'm doing that missing add-in part. The gotcha. other thing that we like to do with this is that when we play salute, we teach them to say, my add-in is one. You know, my add-in is one. And then the person would say, your sum is four because they're adding them together. Gotcha. So the part that they're saying we get that vocabulary in there because we miss so much with vocabulary sometimes with our kids, right? Gotcha. But think about vocabulary as when do they ever hear the word some? They don't hear it out in public when they're out there or they don't no. hear it from their parents. The only time they hear add in and some and those kind of words are in math class. So we have our own vocabulary. We have our own foreign language if you want to take it as far as that. But um, I always say equals. I never say some. I say equals, equals. Yeah, equals. But the problem is they begin to see that equals as that's the answer that's coming, right? Exactly. Answer, not that it is a balance for them. So even though we're getting an answer at that point, later on <clears throat> when they have things like three plus one is equal to four plus a number and they have to put a zero out there, what happens? They just add them all together, right? Correct. That's what mine do. 
And I know that's probably what yours did too. They just add them all together. Exactly. So I want to start teaching them that it's a balance. And so one of the ways that I can do that is using a balanced bean. And if you are lucky enough to have a balance like this in your classroom, how many of you guys have a balance that looks like this? Does anybody here have a balance that looks like this? I do not. Okay. So we may have to uh, have a conversation about how you can get a balance like this. Um, one of the things that you can do with this is, especially when we get to that point of where they're doing those problems of, like we just said, three plus one is four, and they have to figure out another number that goes with it. So the good thing about this is it teaches them the community property. Now I've got some of mine in different colors because I use them for integers too. But let's say they've got this problem and they've got, uh, ignore the negatives because I know you can see them here. For this one, let's say it's five plus one. And like I said, we're teaching them to, a balance is four plus two. And so it balances for them. Isn't that awesome? If they can start to see that. So if they've got that two parts, the balance is one of the things that help them to understand that five plus one is equal to four plus two because they're both six, right? So they can start to see that a balance is very good for them to start getting into those, all of the inclusions of a number. Now, remember, if we played split the pot enough, they know that four and two is six. They know that five and one is six. They also know that three plus three is six. So they have that inclusion of a number and we want them to be able to have that. So this is just another way of getting all of that information in. I'm sorry, I sound so nasally, guys, I really am. How many of you have ever used wordless number problems? Anybody here used wordless, uh, um, numberless wordless, <laughs> listen to me, numberless word problems. How many of you have used numberless word problems? I think the allergy medicines went to my head. How many of you guys have used numberless word problems? Anybody? So with this, what you do is you, of course, select the word problem that you want and you just remove all the numbers. You put the word some, a little bit more, uh, a little less, those kind of words back in there. And then you read through the problem and ask the child what they notice about the problem. This gets them thinking. One of the things that this does is it really helps them with understanding the process of a word problem. And I love this for that, that purpose right there. It gets them thinking about what's the process I'm going to use, not that I just need to throw some numbers together. That's where we lose our kids. They, they want to just throw those numbers together and either add them all or subtract them and try to find an answer. And then we're going to have them to identify information they need to solve that problem. And then, of course, they're going to choose a strategy in which they would use to solve that problem. Now, one of the things you want to do, avoid writing these problems from scratch. You don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. So you already probably have a bank of problems. Just use one of them, change some names, change the context out of it to something that's more real world for your students. And then later on, you're going to add the numbers back. So, and of course, big time is remove the question because that's, that's huge for our students. So in this case, if I'm looking at this, it says Kim sees three bugs. Kim sees some bugs. Matt sees four bugs. Matt sees a few more bugs. How many bugs did they see? I would remove that one. And I would ask my students, so Kim sees some bugs. Matt sees some more bugs. And they would say, well, what, kind, what, what do we need to know? And then they would say, well, how many bugs did they see? And they would say, well, that could be a question, right? How many bugs did they see? And I'd say, how would you find that out? And they would say, well, I need to know how many. And so we would talk through that problem, that right there. And so would I add them together? Would I subtract them? 
how would I have that conversation? And I would go through and I would see how they would write that. So I'm going to give you just a minute. And in the chat, I want you to choose either, well, let me go back, B, uh, B from first grade or A from second grade or B from second grade and write this as a numberless word problem. So again, we're going to take out the question and you're just going to put some words in there for one of these. So taking that and in the chat, just go ahead real quickly, choose one of those and rewrite it. And we're going to talk about them. I'm glad to see that we have some people who have used the numberless word problems and some that have not. So this is a really good way to get our students started. But think about your students and how this would get them to thinking. Okay, we have one that says Kyle got some new shirts for his birthday. If he already had some shirts, how many shirts does he have now? That's one. Oh, I'm liking these. Kim sees some bugs. Matt sees some more bugs than Kim. How many bugs could Matt have seen? That's good. Kyle got some new, uh, new shirts on his birthday. He already had some. That's the one where we can, like I said, if we've left that question off, uh, like Nikki did there, then we can have them to ask that question. What's something we could get from this information? And now they're coming up with that question, and we would really want them to come up with that question. Um, and they may come up with some different ones than what we expect. So this is a really good one for us to do with our students and just get them thinking the process through for word problems. And I know that they're going to be like, well, what was their birthday gifts? Or um, what was the pet that they got? If you take out, you know, the fish and you just said, you know, at a pet shop and he got some, you know, fish and some other fish and, you know, I love the fact that at this point I would take out the three packages of fish food because that's extra information that they would have. And we would talk about that when we got to, to the original problem about having information in that they don't need. That's huge for our students is when it has extra information because my kids would automatically see if I'm looking at the second grade A there, they would see 15, 7, and 3, and they would throw it all in there and say, I got 25. The first thing they'd do. And you'd have to go back and talk to them about three packets of fish food. The question was, how many fish did he buy? Do I need that information of three packets of fish food? And so that's really huge for our students, is understanding and being able to mark out the information that is extra that they don't need. So that's huge for our students. All right. Content scaffolding progression. How many of you guys have ever used content scaffolding progression? This is a, a Rick, Rick uh, a Riccobini. This is a Paul Riccobini thing that he has done, and it's huge for our students. Um, and I love this because we start with the original problem, and you scaffold that original word problem back. So getting our students to understand that scaffolding and scaffolding back into. So if I'm looking at the original problem, this is the full original problem down here. You can see where my cursor's at. And it's Robert planted an oak seedling. It grew 10 inches the first year. Every year after it grew one and a fourth inches, how tall was the oak tree after nine years? Now, this is a typical fifth grade problem. And I know most of you are not fifth grade, but for our for our purposes, I wanted to use a, hard, a little harder problem. We're going to take that problem, and what I do is I basically take it and I just put it back in. <clears throat> I take out any useless information in the first. <coughs> I'm sorry. I take out any useless information in the first that they may not need. I also take out names and those kind of things because I don't want that to be distracting. My first problem is going to be heavily guided, and it's going to include the answer, okay? So if you notice from this problem here, which is the one with Robert in it, to my first problem, it says an oak seedling grew 10 inches in the first year, and every year after it grew one inch. After nine years, the oak tree was 18 inches tall. The first thing you're going to notice is that there's the answer. 
So my students are going to be like, it has the answer. They may not realize it even has the answer. This is where it gets them into understanding to look at the whole problem. Now, one of the things that I would want for my students to do is I was talking to them. I want them to draw this out using either a number line or a bar graph. I mean, a, a bar model. Sorry, I said a bar graph, a bar model. So I'm going to slide this over. I'm going to again bring up my uh, camera and we're going to talk through this problem. Now, you're looking at my camera here. This says, and I want them, remember, all this entire time, I want them using math strategies, whether it's a number line, and it can be. So I can draw a number line down here. I'm going to do this two different ways so that my students can see it. I would say, okay, let's talk, talk about what's the start. What is the start in that problem? So the oak seedling grew 10 inches the first year. So 10 is going to be my start. So if this is zero, I know my first year it grew 10, right? And we're going to talk about this is the start. And it could even be, if I'm doing a bar model, I can say, this is my bar model. My first year it grew 10, and I may put a one up there, right? This is my first year it grew 10. And then it's, I'm going to say, and every year after it, it grew one inch, right? So every year it grew one. For how long? After nine years. So how many numbers am I going to have at the top here? Nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that should equal 18, right? because that's how far, how much it was. After nine years, the tree was 18. So my ending should be 18. Now, again, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is gonna be 18. So, and then I'm gonna go through here and each one of these is gonna be how much? one right one 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 each year it grew one and then it was at 18. so this total amount here was how much eight and then again here 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 and they would do one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And they would be able to see that after nine years, it is 18. And so we could talk through that one. And then I would move down to the second one and I would have the students to do the second one. And then I would lead part of that discussion saying, you know, what do we know? Well, the first year it was 25. So where's our start? 25. Every year after that, it grew five feet. So my group, my things are going to be what? Instead of just one, they're going to be five. And so, and then we're going to talk about that and having them to draw through it again and to model that so that they can see that. This would be a great one to do with Quiznery rods because they can get the 10 and then the ones after that and they can see how it, how it does. And then again, that would be the concrete moving into the semi-concrete at this point. So Quisnery rods would be a really good one to do with that. You could do that with um, building blocks at this point. You could do the linking. They had 10 and then every year after that in a different color, those kind of things they can see. And then of course, with the third one that they do, as you can notice back here in the third one, what do we do? What do we add to this? Well, of course, we added what? We added back in the question. After seven years, how tall was the oak tree? Now we have the results at the end we don't know. So we have to figure that out. So now we've got the question back in. And then, of course, we could throw in either some information that is not needed, or we could throw in a fraction, 
whatever else needs to be done for the last one so that they can bring that back in. Of course, it's going to be something they've already worked on. So they've already worked on fractions. So we're throwing the fraction back in. It's going to be something that, you know, like that, that they've already worked on that I may, or like I said, information that's not needed so they know to mark it out and they can go on through the problem. I want to do this as a your turn and we're also going to take a break with it because it's 10.55. Uh, and just to give my employees a little bit of chance to do this. Take some time to choose one or the other of those and write out and scaffold your problem back the same way that I did for the CSP. That way the content scaffolding progression that you would teach this problem in. And think about that. Remember the first two problems have the answer in it and not a question. So take just a few minutes I hope you have time to change these over and do three problems. Remember, if we're doing the content scaffolding progression, which helps our students to basically start to understand what's being asked in a problem, what we're doing is with the first problem, we take out any other useless information that's there that they may have in the problem. Number two, we take out the question and we give an answer instead. Now, the other thing that we do, we do that for the first two problems. The third one, we add back just the question and the third one, we can add back either information that they don't need to work the problem or we can add in like fractions or if they work with decimals, maybe some decimals or things like that back into the problem. So keep that in mind. Um, so that's what we've got for this one. Now, fluency, standard, uh, fluency to 20 strategies that we're going to work with. We want to work with, of course, doubles. It seems like they understand doubles a little bit better than most, and it seems like one of the things that they can get. And then, of course, near doubles. So we look at six and six is 12. So six plus seven is six and six and one more. And we talk to them about those kind of things. Um, so we work with the near doubles. And then, of course, we work with 10 plus a number. So 10 plus a number, and that's really hard sometimes for our students to get. So 10 plus 9 is 19. That's, that's kind of hard for them to get. And then what, what is 9 plus a number? Well, 9 plus a number is 10 plus that number subtracting 1. And then 8 plus a number is 10 plus that number subtracting 2. Or if they know 9 plus a number, then it's just subtracting 1 at that point in time. So those are the fluency standards to 20 that we really want to hit on. Uh, we use their doubles, their near doubles, 10 plus a number, 9 plus a number, and 8 plus a number. So keep in mind, these are some that we really want to do. Okay, we're not going to do, let's take a, t a t uh, we're going to do the strategies. So common misconceptions when adding and subtracting. This is huge. So common misconceptions that we have for our students typically happen is subtracting. The smaller from the larger number is a rule that children apply regardless of the minimum. If we look at this, we, we typically, this is not true because we get into negative numbers later. And so that's an issue. Not regrouping is another issue that they have, that we see that they have. And then ignoring the zero. So if we talk about subtracting the smaller number from the larger number, in this case of 62, take away 45, we get 23. Um, you want to look at, do they understand place value? And that if I've got two, can I take five away from that? Or do I need to regroup? In our case, we would talk to them about breaking it apart. This is where bundles and sticks would come in handy for us to have. And those are real easy to create. And having the students to create their own bundles and sticks. And, in, and even having a bundle of 100 to where they're taking them apart and putting them back together. If you don't have that, make sure you have some of the blocks for our students to work with so that they can see that happening. And then of course, show them what that looks like on a number line and having them to bounce back on it in an open number line. So like I said, if you don't have uh, the 10 rods and the ones and the hundreds uh, flats, make sure that you're working with those um, if you don't have bundles and sticks so that they understand that. But also, what does that look like on a number line? And having an open number line to where they can do that with. So those are important things for them to be able to see. 
and then also talk to them about doing the inverse at that point in time and checking. So 45 plus 23, what is that? Does that equal? And so do that check mechanism that they need to do. And then, of course, not regrouping. How is that affecting them? So many times for them, they'll say, well, that looks about right. When you ask them, that's important too. And then, of course, ignoring the zeros. They tend to do that a lot where they'll just say, it's five in this case. And then, of course, if you are working with students below second grade, um, below third grade, below third grade, at no point does it talk about us going ahead and doing the regrouping uh, with carrying. We don't do that. We've got different strategies that they're using. And if they've built on those strategies, then that's the way that they need to be doing it. They should not be taught to carry before then. They should be taught at using the numbers and place value and those kind of things. So we're going to talk through some different ones that they can do today. All right. When adding and subtracting um, strategies, this right here is one that you can go to. You can click on each one of these. And Miss Vonda went through and love her. Uh, dearly, she created little videos. I helped her create doodlies and she did the voiceover to them to where you can use these in your classroom for a student to watch. So anyway, those are there for them to use and then they can go back and see those. So we're going to stop this one. Each one of these has a little video with them. So you have the addition strategies and you have the subtraction strategies that we're going to discuss today and have a video that students can watch and reuse. So, of course, the split strategy. This strategy is based on place value. Of course, our students need to know place value. It's very hard for our students when they don't understand place value to see where they went wrong. And so, if they've built enough with the, with the bundles and sticks, if they've created enough with the um, place value uh, cubes, if they've done enough with uh, building tins, uh, with our cubes, those kind of things, then they will have a good understanding. Of course, with this one here, they will understand that 30, that I can decompose numbers. And so we talk about decomposing numbers all the time. And I talk about that 38 is three tens and eight ones. Three tens and eight ones. It's also 20 and 18. So they understand that they can pull that back apart and it can be multiple things. So 38 is, and then you can, you can just discuss those kind of things. What is 38? And they decompose that number quite often and you need to be able to do that. And so if they understand place value, that's 30 and eight and 49 is 40 and nine. Then at that point, they quickly understand that 30 plus 40 is 70. And that 8 and 9 is 17. And I can pull that 1 over. Again, very similar to regrouping. That 1 group of 10 over that adds to my 80. Now it's 87. And so that's what I want them to be able to do with the split strategy. Now let's talk about your turn. Now choose one of these just real quickly and do it using the split strategy. Just take a few minutes. Uh, actually, I'll give you about... A minute and a half to do it and then I'm going to show you on our mat how that we did each one of those just to make sure you have an example okay so we're gonna start with this one first of all let's break it apart again we're doing the split strategy so I'm going to do 50 and 6 and 30 and 2 right and so I'm looking here, this is 80, and this is 8, and we'll add them together, which I get 88. Now, that's 1. Let's look at this one here. So I've got 100, 30, and 4, and I could have my students to actually build this if I wanted to, and then 643. Then I get 777, and so and then I want to put those together, which means I'm going to have 777. 
Now, that's going to be those. If a parent starts asking you about why are you teaching my student to my child to do that, one of the things that I do is I talk to them about money. And I say, okay, if you're given hundreds, twenties, fifties, tens, and fives and ones, where do you start at when you count your money? Well, I would start with the hundreds. And when they say that, then say, why am I teaching our students to add starting in the ones? So talk to them about how place value is so important for our students and how we are teaching our students to truly see in mathematics place value and the importance of place value. And so that's one of them that we can do. Let's look at the next one here. So that was your turn. The jump strategy. Now this is with a number line. Guys, I'm going to apologize, but I have to drink. My voice just goes. So with this number line on this one, as we can see, we have 38 plus 49. And we are starting with the larger number. Now they can start with 38. And then they can build on 49. That's fine. But in this case, we say 49, and then we add 10, we add 10, we add 10. So we had the 30 out of the way. And then we've broken this down into friendly 10s. So and now, if I can decompose a number, which is the 8, and I know that I need one more to get to 80, and then that 7 more is going to make my 8, which goes to 87. That's what I really want my students to be able to see. Now, some of them may not be able to do that. But we talk to them all the time about how to decompose what's inside of 8. Well, 7 and 1, 6 and 2, and then how am I going to get to my friendly 10? And so we're going to work through that with another problem just real quick on the next one. So look at this one. And I want you to think about the jump strategy I just showed you. So if I'm talking about the jump strategy that I just showed you. Taking that one into consideration, we're going to take the bigger problem down there. We're going to take the 132 plus 54, and we're going to do the jump strategy with that one. Okay? So again, I'm going back. We're going to look at this. So when, here's 130. 2 plus 54. If I'm doing that one on a number line, this is 132. I need to do 54. I know that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, tens. So this is add 10, add 10, add 10 that I need to do. And I'm going to say that takes care of my 50, right? So this is 142, 152, 162, 172, 182, and now I need 4. Now, most of my kids can probably just do add 4 more, and that's going to be 186. They're probably going to be able to do that. If not, and they need to do this, it's perfectly fine. Because they may say, okay, I'm going to add 4. And at this point, they may need to do this right here. 1, 2, 3, 4. And this is add 1, add 1, add 1, add 1. And they may do 183, 184, 185, 186. And if they have to do that, that's fine. If that's what they need to do. So that is one way that we can do the jump strategy. Now, let's go ahead and move on, for lack of time here, to partial sums. Now, with partial sums, it's a little different. I like to do color coding with this to start out with. Now, color coding is important for our students sometimes because I use two colors and I'll just circle the sums they're talking about and write the color in. So, a good example that I may do, I'm going to just use a sheet of paper for this, if I have a, just a blank sheet of paper, 
can't do that here. Okay. Let's say I'm just going to use a blank sheet of paper and I'm going to do the next one on it. So if you notice, this one is I'm doing 30 plus 40 is 70 and 8 plus 9 is 17 and then I just add these up. Now, this is when they get a little farther down and you're not using maybe the jump strategy or those kind of things. And this one, 100 plus 500 is 600. They need to know place value really well. 30 plus 50 is 80. 6 plus 3 is 9. And then they just add up. This is so much easier for our students to understand and to be able to do. So let's do. And then, of course, partial sum expanded notation is this way where they do 500 plus 30 plus 3, 300 plus 20 plus 7. This is easier for our students to see if they expand those numbers out and then to add them up at the end. That's an easy one for them to do. So let's do this one here. Like I said, I like using different colors so that my students have a little bit better understanding if they need it. But if I'm doing 327 plus 488, let's say that I wanted to do that one. This is the one we're doing. Now I may go ahead and they would circle this one and they would say this is 700, right? And then maybe they know that 20 and 80 is 100. And then they know, and they may even use a different color, that 8 and 7 is 15. Do you see how the color coding can help with this? And then at this point they would just say it's 15 and that's 800. And so we can have that conversation about color coding and those kind of things because that may be part of their SDI that they need is color coding in, in with the strategies that you're working with. So this is just one of those strategies that we can use to help our students. But again, they need to have place value and this is a little bit more complicated for them. So, but it's one that I would definitely want to get to. Um, so... Why do so many students struggle with subtraction? It's the same reason that students struggle with counting backward. One, exposure. Two, it is what? The opposite of addition, right? So the other thing is we teach them take away or we teach them to borrow. Now, if I ask you to borrow your candy bar, do you expect it back? No, because you know I'm going to eat it, right? So really, are we borrowing? Subtraction is distance. It is distance on the number line, or it is the difference and is not understood. So, and then subtraction is neither commutative, because addition, if we're doing addition, that's commutative, nor is it associative, which is another case with addition. And then, of course, our sequence of learning. We don't put them together. If we're building together, we should be re taking away or we should be what? Instead of taking away, we should be breaking apart in which that way they are understanding. If we're building five, then we should break apart five and we should see the inclusion of that number. Three and two, one and four. So we're building it, and then we're breaking it apart. Uh, so those are all the things of why we struggle with subtraction. One thing many times is the reason why they think they can just take zero, take away that number is five, is we also don't show them that there are numbers past zero on the number line. So there are negative numbers. And that's a big part for us too. Place value strategies for subtraction. One, split apart, and then the other one that we have here 
is uh, split apart into groups. So we're going to look at that. This is why that inclusion of the number is so important. The first one is 50. We start with 56 and we take away 20, right? And then we take away 7 from that number. The other one is we know that 56 is what? 40 and 16 is 30 and 26. So now we're going to look at, okay, 40 take away 20, which is 20. And then what? 16 take away 7 is 9, and then we add those together. Now, that's where it gets a little confusing for our students, is when we add that back together instead of just subtracting. Another way that we can do, and we'll come back to this one, is the jump strategy. And this is one I truly love. Not saying not to do the other one, but this is a really good one. Using a number line, so they start to see that distance on the number line. I've got 45, and I'm taking away 27. Well, if I start at 45... And I take away 10, I'm at 35. I take away another 10, I'm at 25. And then I look at 7. What do I know about 7? Well, it's 5 and 2, 6 and 1, 3 and 4. What number is going to make it easy within the 10s for me to use? Well, 5 and 2. So I take away another 5, and then I take away 2, and I'm at 18. So they can start to see that. Jump strategy. Let's just work on this one using the jump strategy. This one is 56 take away 38. I'm looking at this problem right here. 56 take away 38. I'm doing this on a number line. Remember, we went forward on the number line using the jump strategy. Now we're going to go backward on the number line. So I'm at 56. What do I know about 38? It's three tens. One, two, three. So subtract 10, subtract 10, subtract 10. This one's going to be at 46. This one's going to be at 36 and this one's at 26. Now I should be able to look up here and see 30 and then I need to do 8. What do I know about 8? Thinking about that inclusion of a number, it's 1 and 7, 2 and 6. So I've got the 6 right there so I can do 2 and 6. So if I go 6, this is back at 20. If I go 2 more, I'm at 18. So there's that one. And I should be able to quickly look up here and go 10, 20, 30, 36, 37, 38. If I need to. And if they need to, can they jump back each number of 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way back? Absolutely, they can. We're not going to change that. So let's look again at the next one. This one is partial differences. So if I'm looking at partial differences... The one thing about this one is sometimes we have trouble understanding. Now, I had a student in the old, in the upper grades who used negative numbers, and he understood negative numbers well because this is the way his mother had taught him using money. And she ran a little, uh, I want to call it a mama pop store that was up the road, and she had taught him all about if she owed something that was a, a she was in debt and it was a negative. Um, or if somebody uh, at that point owed her money and they hadn't paid it, that was, she was still in, you know, she still had that money that was a negative, be added back at some point, but at that point it wasn't. She talked to him about all those kind of things and had him to sit with her and would help her balance the budget in their store. And he understood this using basically negative numbers. And so... In the case of this one, we're looking at 56 take away 23. Of course, we're looking at place value again. So 50 take away 20 would be 30. And then 6 take away 3 would be 3 more, right? And I could add those together. Now, in this case over here at the second one, I've got 31 take away 18. Now, I've got 30, and I take away 10, that's 20. But now I've got 1, and I need to take away 8. Can I do that? If I'm thinking the way my student did, I've got 1, but I, I, I have $1, but I owe you $8. I'm $7 in debt, right? So that's going to be a subtract 7. So now that's going to be 20 take away 7. This is really hard sometimes for our students to see unless we're talking about money. So this is another way that we can do this. So, let's just kind of walk through one real quick. 
Um, this one talks about change one or both numbers and subtract then compensate. That's compensation. Adding by compensation, if we did that one and then subtract back off, that's another way. But I want us to go through and do just this one right here using that understanding with the subtraction. So 75 take away 38. So we're going to go over and we're going to use that one and we're going to walk through that one. So again, I want you to think about negative numbers or again, think about in debt. So if I've got $70 or $75 and I want to take away 38, if I'm looking at this right here, 70 take away 30, that's 40. Now I've got five, I got $5, but I owe eight. So that's going to be a negative three, it's still $3 in debt. If I remove that, that's $37 that I have. So this is what it's like for compensation. Again, it may be a little harder for your students to use. You may want to use the jump strategy for a while and then turn around and use this strategy beside of it so the students can see what's happening. And then transformation, this is changing both numbers while preserving the results. And in this case, we add 2 to 58, we take 2 from 27, so if we're, take, we're adding the one, we're taking from the other. And then we maintain the quantity of the entire problem, and that's 60 plus 25, which equals 85. That's really hard for our students sometimes. Adding by transforming, we add 1 to both numbers, keeping the distance on the number line the same. So we're making a friendly 10 in this case. So it's 57 take away 30 equals 27. That's another strategy that our kids can use. Understanding that subtraction is big time distance on the number line. And so we're not going to do a, we really don't have time to do a your turn on that one. So adding tens, of course, this one is uh, kind of hard. So if you're adding tens to one, you're taking tens from the other. And so looking how to do that and keeping that distance on the number line the same. So transformation strategy using used to avoid regrouping. One of the things that I did for my students is if they were all zeros on the top because most of my students would not be able to go back through and would not be able to take away, I told them to just take one from both of them. Now it turned it into 599. I mean, 5,099, 999, and it changed the bottom to 3,641. I just changed it by one, did not change the distance on the number line. And we would do this with smaller numbers to get them started so they would be able to see this. And they were able to do it. If I wanted to get that bottom number to a friendly 10, what does it take to get 28 to a friendly 10? 30, I'm adding two, I'm going to add two to the top number. This, of course, is a your turn. And again, you would subtract one from the top. You subtract one from the bottom. The top would be now 4,999. The bottom number would now be 2,656. They would be able to subtract with no problem. That's what this problem is about. Now, I want to kind of talk to you about time test and what does time test look like for our students. First of all, I'm not a fan of them because they really give me the jitters. Um, time test makes my brain go, Wah! and then I can't really do anything. I can't remember things, right? So if it does that to me, I can imagine what it does to my students who get frustrated sometimes with time test. So time tests are the beginnings to math anxiety for about one third of our students. Time test prompts many students to turn away from math. I can't do it. I'm just going to stop. I'm, not, I'm never going to get all these problems completed. One, for my kids who struggle with just being able to organize, if I see time test and it's got, let's say, 60 problems on there, I completely stop. My kids did better with cards and understanding uh, that I just flip over card and do that next problem, just do that next problem. They were fine with that. I'm not never saying don't give time tests. I'm just saying make them very infrequent. Time test pushes the brain to survival mode. Now, Doug's got a good thing that he does with survival mode. And 
yet I've got it all together. My brain's like this, right? And I can't exactly do it as good as Doug, but basically what happens is when all of my senses are out and I'm in survival mode, everything's going kind of wild, right? And if I'm in survival mode and I, everything's just on end and my brain's just going, ah, like this, guess what I'm not able to do? I'm not able to reason. I'm not able to think. I'm very emotional at this point. So I'm probably going to blurt out. I'm going to maybe say things. I'm probably going to do things that I don't, I, sh I typically wouldn't do because my brain is just like wide open, right? I'm at that point of flight or fight. And that's what happens with our students. And then sadly, speed and test driven classrooms may lead students to, uh, who are slow, deep thinkers to just not even try, that they think they can't be good at math. And so that is very true for a lot of our students. They get that complex and, you know, I hear parents say all the time, well, I wasn't good at math either. Well, I'm sorry, it's not a genetic gene. Truthfully, what it is, is the fact that, you know, you've said that too, and your student may think it now, but the fact of the matter is there's an anxiety there for mathematics. It's not understanding, not having those skills that they need. So keep that in mind when you're doing a lot of time tests and those kind of things that those kids who need to really think or have time to think may not be thinking because they are already, their little brains are going wide open at this point in their survival mode and they can't. They've already been overloaded and it's too much. And so you're not getting good results. And then of course, math facts are a smaller part of mathematics and, prob uh, uh, and probably the less interesting part because most of the time after this, our students are gonna have to truly reason. Math facts are important. We want them to have automaticity with math facts, but we want them to also understand reasoning. That's the reason why I put I kind of put that content scaffolding uh, progression in there. I put the numberless word problems in there because they need to be able to reason through the mathematics. And then last but not least, um, they need access by strategy. And then of course, um, occasionally they're good for diagnostic purposes. We want them to be able to, um, we want to know how well they can do within a certain amount of time because that helps us also to know if they need extended time in comparison to their peers. And then, of course, um, consider limiting the time of the assessments, how much time they get on things, and you just take it up. And it's not taken up as a grade so, per se, but just to see where you're at. And then allow students to own their own assessments by having them to do it and then they graph where they're at and seeing if they can beat their own time and not against somebody else. And then grade for mastery of a strategy and not a percentage. And then of course, I wanna to talk to you about the commit screeners and I hope we got enough time. Yeah, uh, hopefully we do. The commit screeners, you can find those. I'm gonna go through there. Here are all the commit screeners. You can download them. When you download them, I'm gonna to go to the second grade one here. You're going to go here. You're going to click on your downloads. You're going to get the PDF version. This is what you need. These are all the cards you need for second grade. All right, that's all the cards you're going to need. So you click on that. Let me go back. Um, so if you click on this right here, you can view it. I have to, these are the cards for first grade. Let's go back. This is the screener. So you can view that. This is the screener. What I like about this is it gives you exactly what you need to say. So stop count, uh, start counting from one and I'll tell you when to stop. And then at 22, you're going to tell them to stop and they're going to count. Then you just mark it. Were they able to count to 10? Were they able to count 11 through 22 correctly? And so at this point, they were unsuccessful from one to 10 and you just mark where they were at. What is one more than six? You're just talking them through it and then can they correctly give you one more than six? Um, one of the things that I did out from here and on down here, I think it gives you the option of where they were able to 
not on this one. It's on second grade. But it tells you what cards to put in front of them. The cards are available to you. This gives you a good understanding of where your students are at, basically. So you can give them. There's three times a year for these that you can give them, which really helps. And I talk about vocabulary. Granite vocabulary cards. I want you to see these. These are vocabulary cards that you can use on your walls. So you can just go ahead and download the list. Tells you what they are. I like these because it's got the word. This could make a great matching game. It's got the word and it's got something, a visual, right? Two plus three is five. And then it's got the definition along with the visual. So you could actually cut these up and this could be a great matching card. So to combine, put together two or more quantities. And then add in. These are add ins. Any number being added. And so like you can see all the way down through here, it's got the words and what you will need. And it's got the definition. So if you were putting this bird up in a log clock, here's what an analog clock looks like. This is a clock that shows time by positioning of an hour and minute hand. So as you can see, it's got some really good things for vocabulary. It's got all the things that you really need. And on our website, when you come to our website, you will see it says, Welcome to KVX Exceptional Children. We've got some really great stuff on here with behavior. Doug's got wonderful things on there for behavior. If you're looking for literacy, Chastity's put a lot of good stuff on here. Heather, if you've got a hearing impaired student. Um, if you've done any of our stuff on explicit instruction, we've got some things there. But here's Math Max, which is what I'm here to talk about today. So you click on here. Here's some things that we've done for worked examples. Sorry about that. Addition and subtraction, if you go under that one. We've got different things that are on there. Different videos and resources that you can go to. For some reason, it's taking a minute or two. So addition and subtraction, you'll see, are different videos that you can use. Of course, here's that addition and subtraction strategies that I had pulled for this. But those are all in here and also using a bead string there's several activities on there that i've done for using a bead string and how you can use a bead string in your classroom to do addition and subtraction up to 20. and then of course melissa hall from breathitt county did a activity on split the pot that's on here so just a few things that is our website back to our resources the Kentucky Center for Mathematics is a wonderful resource. It's got the KMP site on it. You'll want to go to the KMP site for games, activities, and those kind of things. You'll go under resources. Under resources, you'll see the KMP intervention guide. You'll need to put in your email. You can sign up for this. It's completely free. Okay. Um, I want to go ahead and put in my email. Your username will be bluegrass. I want to tell you now because they don't track you and it's math but you'll need to sign in first now when i go to search the intervention guide i go here and i usually go by task grouping and the reason i go by task grouping is because a is all your addition f is your fractions m is your multiplication nb is numeracy nf is fluency ni is number identification and then you got s for subtraction t for Oh, I forgot what T is for, but it's not time. And then, uh, of course, measurement is the. So there's multiple games on here. It has everything you will need. I'm going to go to fraction number lines because I love fractions. Activities in which you can choose. As you notice, they're scaffolded from zero to five. So you'll want to start out with zero to see where your student's at. I'm going to pick two because let's say which one my student is. I'm going to go to the bottom. It's going to have the lesson plans that I can download and put to the front of my thing. And then it's gonna have all the cards and the things that I need to do the activity with. And so I can sit down with my students, I can print these off and I can have multiple games. I put these on cardstock, that helps a lot. 
The next thing is Didax Virtual uh, Manipulatives. This is a really good site for your students. These are virtual manipulatives that you can use with your students. And I know last year coming out of COVID, you probably needed some. The math balance that you saw me use, they have a virtual one here. It's not as good as using, and I'm gonna say this, concrete materials, which is number one on our list, it's not as good as using the concrete, but if they've used the concrete several times, you can move on to the math balance that's on here. Same thing with two color calendars. If you have a student who is on virtual, this is one way to get some of those manipulatives in though. All right, so back to our thing. Like I said, I know we only got a few minutes. Three act task. This is a great place to get some different good high quality uh, or high um, yield um, activities. This goes from third grade all the way up into calculus, as you can see. And this is a wonderful site to be able to use. Another thing is at the bottom of this site, there's different ones where you can go get. Graham Fletcher has some wonderful ones. Robert Kaplinski has some great ones too. So go to these different sites and check them out. And there are they are di different tasks that you can do that get students involved with some really good high reasoning skills. So another great one for our students. Um, and of course, the last thing is our math tool. This is what Fonda and I and several other wonderful ladies worked together and created. And this one talks about what is, and it's done with tears, of course. But what is the good strategies that you need to be doing the entire time in math classroom? What is that good core instruction look like? And then, of course, for tier one and tier three. Now, for us as special ed teachers, what we're going to look at is the evidence-based practices that are down through here. And we even put in what was Hattie's effect size for each one of these. So use of manipulatives just by themselves is 0 0.5. And it's got some different ones on here. Kathy Richardson games and strategies. Of course, repetitive corrective feedback, 0 0.79. So again, like I talked about earlier, giving that feedback, two or three problems at the most and making sure I'm correcting them quickly. So if your student has a problem, the problem or concern that they have, if it's something down through here, these are the things that you can use for that student to help them to correct the problem in which they're having. And then of course, for us, anytime we're doing anything, we need to have the evidence that that student has done those things and then collect the data to say yes or no, that worked. And so these are the ways that you can do that. So this is just one of the things. If you notice, if your student has trouble with math, math calculations, these may be the areas in which they have. This is not an exhaustive list. It's being worked on all the time and added to. So you'll want to keep that in mind also, okay? And if there's something that you say, hey, you need to add to your toolkit, if you'll send it my way, I will definitely get in here and change the toolkit because it's, it's published to the web and it's constantly changing. So keep that in mind. And then, so the way we set it up was math calculations at the top, math reasoning, and then any areas that fall under just mathematics in general is next and then of course like i said anything that's blue is hyperlinked to somewhere else where you can get even more materials so then at the end if you want to dive deeper of course we've got screeners and assessments that you may want to look at we've got additional resources that you can go to we have down here articles that we feel are very valuable these are articles that vonda and i have looked at or used in a lot of our trainings and so we felt that they were important for our teachers to have. And of course, anytime we do anything with our special ed, we put the IEP and lesson plan development handbook in there. So this is just a few of the different ones that we've done. Now, that is our resources. Of course, if you need to speak to us right now, Ms. Vonda has retired and we miss her greatly, but these are our people that you can contact, Chastity Craft, uh, Heather Hall, she's our uh, KSD, uh, Kentucky School for the Deaf. Tony Howard is our Kentucky School for the Blind. We have Miss Dion Bates, she's our implementation lead. Brenda Combs, who is our due process lead. 
Of course, my name is Stephanie Kidd. I'm a math consultant here. And then Miss Cheryl Mathis has left us too. Um, but we have Mr. Doug Smith, who is awesome with behavior, and Mr. Denny Paul May, who is a due process consultant. So if you have any questions, uh, now's a good time. If not, this is our feedback form. Doug's going to put it in the chat. He's already put it in the chat. Look at that. He's really good. So that is our feedback. You can scan it. I hope you had a good day. I am sorry for my voice. I'm sorry for being nasally sounding and coughing and those kind of things. Unfortunately, allergies have got the best of me.